Hi gang, thanks for joining me uh, over this uh, webcast. I'm basically uh, just going to give you a quick overview of some of the different readings. I'm glad you everybody got home safe. I apologize about the uh, the delay. Maybe some of you were expecting to do an online course, um, to do a live course, but I'm really not going to do that. I'm not going to do that tonight or next week, primarily because uh, there's really no requirements for you to have any kind of live web-based interactive technology, although many of you could certainly learn it. Um, I, I don't want to introduce that kind of complexity. So what I'm going to do is record the lectures that, that we have to miss, that is this week's lecture and, and next week's lecture, um, and just to try to present to you some interesting information like you see up on the screen right now. You must be wondering what the heck is a Bible quote from Judges doing up on the screen. Um, We'll go into that in a few minutes. I, I hope to make these uh, little brief recorded lectures. And when I say brief, I guess I'm shooting for about 20 minutes. Uh, I don't want to go over 20 minutes. So that, that makes for a nice lecture. <laughs> Hopefully we can do that in class, right? So, okay. Uh, well, I'm glad, again, glad everybody got home safe and um, the weather's not, not so good out there. So let's get into the class content. The goal for tonight, the class topic is from aptitude to achievement testing, um, the imperative of evidence-based practice, the importance of evidence-based practice. Right now, it's important to think about how aptitude by treatment interactions or how the use of intelligence tests may not indicate evidence-based practice, may not be an evidence-based practice. That's something very important to think about. It really brings up a bit of a conundrum. Well, why do we spend so much time doing it? Why did we spend so much time learning it? Well, hopefully you spend so much time learning it so you can understand the critiques behind it. Two of those critiques were offered by Frank Gresham. And then another uh, one critique was offered by Frank Gresham, which is one of the original um, summaries of the aptitude by treatment interaction research and then again offered in a more contemporary fashion by Jeff Braden and again he sort of dismissed any of the evidence for the um, aptitude by treatment interaction okay so the use of intelligence tests for informing intervention or the use of any test for informing intervention that's a kind of validity called treatment validity, or what you might call treatment utility. The test is valid if it gives you information that you can use that will directly improve someone's functioning. Right. So the question is, how can intelligence tests do that, um, or aptitude tests do that? Well, the answer is, is they can't do that. It's really challenging. Well, I can't say that they can't do that. Now, I guess that's Braden's point. I would be wrong in saying that they can't do that. The right thing to say, or the right thing that I should say, according to Braden, would be to say that we don't have evidence to date supporting the use of intelligence tests for improving students' academic achievement, which is the only reason they're in school, and one of the only reasons that you, as a school psychologist, would get involved with needing to support a student. One of the main reasons. Now, there are certain situations where you're going to be asked to support the social emotional health of, of students and it may not seem to be related to their academic functioning but uh, as I had indicated last week and, and we'll talk about more and more um, in the class that when students struggle in school and that is academically and socially and emotionally um, there often is a academic um, academic origin now there's a number of I would say maybe 10 to 15 percent of the referrals that you'll get won't have anything to do with academics but let's think about 85 to 90 percent of the referrals to get okay so our curriculum covers social and emotional learning and a, and a number of different things but this class is very specific to uh, treatment validity of tests the treatment validity of achievement tests and your ability to learn about and understand the research behind um, using educational tests to help children uh, improve. Okay, so that's what this class is about. So up on the screen, what you essentially have is 
a depiction of a series of uh, troops from Gideon's army. Um, so take a look at the screen. Uh, it's one of the first intelligence tests ever put on record. Okay, so just take a quick look at the screen. We're going to get into that and talk a little bit about that in a minute. The goal of the class tonight, okay, so the class topic being from aptitude to achievement testing, the imperative of evidence-based practice, right, right from your syllabus, right from the course schedule. Let's see if we can find the course schedule. Right there. There we are. Oh, that's 612. Let's see if we can find the course schedule for 603. Nope, not there. Um, well, if you did look on the course schedule for tonight, we would see that the class topic is from achieve, uh, from aptitude to achievement testing, the imperative of evidence-based practice. Okay. So the goal, what is the goal for tonight's class? The goal for tonight's class is to clarify what is meant by an aptitude by treatment interaction, to illustrate an alternative, what's called a skill by treatment interaction, that occurs when assessment is linked directly to intervention. Another way of saying what the class goal is for tonight is to separate myth from reality, to separate magic from science. I'm not necessarily going to do that. I'm sort of trying to act as a vessel by which I can translate to you more authoritative research and more authoritative uh, reasons why um, we need to be very, very skeptical about the use of intelligence tests, really about the treatment validity of intelligence tests. Okay, so let me get started. The first thing I want to talk about is um, aptitude. So what is aptitude? Um, aptitude can be thought of as an ability that is not directly observable. Okay, you've heard of terms like intelligence, uh, multiple intelligences, learning styles, or really any high inference kind of label applied to a child, applied to a student, applied to a learner. So the word smart, when we call someone smart, that's even a form of an aptitude because it refers to something that's not directly observable. Okay. So it's important to understand what an aptitude is and what it isn't. An aptitude is a label of an ability that's not directly observable. Okay, that's what it is. So what it isn't is a skill, something that you can see and describe very specifically. So the number of words that a child reads per minute, you can say is reading fluency. Okay, so visual processing or what you might call um, something like, looking up some intelligences here, um, crystallized intelligence or general, general memory and learning or auditory perception. None of that is the same as um, reading fluency or math calculation skill. Okay, those are two different things. So an aptitude is not a skill. An aptitude is an inferential, unobservable ability. Okay. So what is treatment? When we're talking about an aptitude by treatment interaction, what do we mean by treatment? Well, it's something that we do on the basis of assessment results. Okay, Treatment is the same thing as an intervention. An intervention for a reading skill, an intervention for a math problem, an intervention for a social-emotional problem. The idea is, is that the assessment itself is supposed to give us information that informs the intervention or links to the intervention. That's another way of saying it. Okay? So far we know what an aptitude we know what aptitude means. We have a general sense of what what is meant by treatment. So what is an aptitude by treatment interaction? An aptitude by treatment interaction is a weak attempt to link assessment to intervention where the assessment data are assessments of, like we said before, these kinds of unobservable processes that we can't see that we have to infer. All right, It's a weak attempt to link the treatment to those sorts of things, to say that because we know of these aptitudes, we can then find some interventions that work in this situation. It says that knowing something about a student's aptitudes or learning style will help to indicate, that's a very important word, indicate, 
Okay. It says that knowing something about a student's aptitudes or style will help to indicate the intervention or treatment that should be used. What the Gresham and the Braden paper and even the Walcott paper says is that the treatments that you get from aptitude assessments or from intelligence tests have been contraindicated. So that's a medical term, essentially means taking on medication for its unintended uses. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so an aptitude by, treat by treatment interaction says that knowing something about a student's aptitudes or style will help to indicate or specify, directly link the intervention or the treatment to the assessment. A simpler way of putting it, says that different people have different ways of learning and if we can figure this out we can maximize the value of the instruction or the intervention so i'm going to point you to a um, daniel willingham <coughs> excuse me uh, uh daniel willingham link through youtube um the link is you can get to the link by going to YouTube and typing in Daniel Willingham right down here or learning styles don't exist. It's um, it's not a authoritative necessarily uh, an opinion piece. He tries to give you some logic and then some research behind it. It's a very neat um, clip. I would like for you to watch this clip. Um, some of what I want to uh, kind of quiz you on um, will come from this clip, but it's also a really neat way to illustrate the difficult um, Let's see, in the Gresham and Witt paper, actually, I think it was in the Braden paper, okay, we have these charts up here, okay? So these charts were easy to understand, okay, to some extent, if you got through the readings and really grappled with the complexity, but the Willingham paper, I'm sorry, the Willingham um, clip is really going to help you understand an aptitude by treatment interaction. There's some neat um, visuals that he uses. Um, he says, yeah, well, I'll let you watch it, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, some of this stuff. Okay. So that's one of the things. Um, one of Something else that I want to say about aptitude by treatment interactions is that it's become sort of absurd and sort of ridiculous. Um, you'll notice well, what's become sort of absurd and ridiculous? Uh, this sort of search for trying to find an unobservable aptitude that we can tap into that will tell us something about how to help someone better or how to feel better about ourselves. This notion of multiple intelligences, right? So you'll see on the Willingham page. So this is, hang, hang out with me here for a little while. I'm going to really try to clarify. Um, it's a hot button topic because a lot of people do believe, and many of you listening to this will believe that different people have different ways of learning. That's fine, but it's such a broad and general statement that as a, tech, as a technician, as a professional school psychologist responsible for the treatment of children, we can't, we can no longer accept these broad general statements. We have to delve down deeper. That's our professional responsibility. And I'll prove that, well, I'll demonstrate that more with, with some of the things that we're going to talk about in a few minutes, okay? But I want you to notice up here on the, on the right, this learning styles do exist. Understanding the 12 ways of learning, okay? So we can go to that one. Um, the eclectic learning profile. Uh, I learned early on in, in my um, training that the word eclectic sometimes means confused. Okay, so I wonder if the seven kinds of smart or the um, three kinds of learning styles, oral, auditory, visual, kinesthetic, or the 12 kinds of learning styles. I wonder if these folks are, are, are doing their best, they, they mean well, Anyone who says that different people have different ways of learning or that children have different learning styles, they mean well. Certainly do. I've heard virtually every teacher I've ever worked with um, say that. And 
you know, it's not my job to, to fight with them about it and to get uh, all academic. My job is to try to help them discover what works. That's my job as a school psychologist, professional responsibility, is to help children ultimately um, not succumb to risk and risk factors, okay? So yeah, they mean well when they say um, things like uh, different children have different learning styles, but um, you wonder where that's going, okay? So my point here is really that the search for different kinds of aptitudes is, is becoming ridiculous and becoming absurd. So I did a little search and I found um, sort of like the 12 days of learning. And that is from Spearman all the way up to, I don't know, you might say Howard Gardner or some others. I found people's book uh, books or, or blogs indicating that there's only one kind of way of learning, two kinds of ways of learning, right? That's Spearman's two-factor theory of intelligence that you probably went over last year, I'm sorry, last semester in uh, Terry's class. We know that Charles Spearman had a two-factor theory of intelligence, right? Well, Sternberg had a three-factor theory of intelligence, right? Didn't he? He had a triarchic theory. Um, I found someone who had a four factor theory of intelligence, right? So how many aptitudes are there? How many learning styles are there? How many ways of learning are there? Well, Kronbach, uh, who originally, now Kronbach was referred to in the Gresham and Witt paper, right about here. Uh, let's see where he started talking about Kronbach. Yeah, right down here, okay. Discuss the concept of the aptitude by treatment interaction. He was referring to Kronbach's paper, 1957. He was referring to the idea of a payoff, that we're, if we're able to identify an aptitude, then the extent to which we can identify that aptitude through assessment leads to a pretty high payoff in terms of treatment outcomes. Okay, But in 1975, he came back around and he said that I was short-sighted not to apply the same argument to interaction effects themselves. And the argument he was talking about was that they may not actually exist. He summarized his findings by saying, once we attend to interactions, once we say that we can match our visual kind of instruction to a visual learner, that's what he's talking about, when we start to do that, we enter a hall of mirrors that extends to infinity. So evidence for that hall of mirrors are things like this. Are things like this seven, oh, where are we here? Seven kinds of smart, 12 kinds of learning styles, three kinds of intelligences. It becomes, like I said, it becomes absurd, not just absurd, very, very hard to get your hands around, to try to, um, to, try to assess. Well, these are my two links to the uh, information that, uh, about uh, aptitudes. So let me bring you back to that picture, okay? So this kind of search, this aptitude by treatment interaction, this challenging, difficult, inferential search to try to find something that is unobservable, like a visual processing skill, started thousands and thousands of years ago. So, example that uh, you, may, you may already know about is that Gideon needed to win a battle with very few uh, troops. Uh, this was a story from the book of Judges in the Bible. Um, so, you see this quote up here, apparently this, the Lord said to Gideon, you shall separate everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, as well as everyone who kneels to drink, okay? So what Gideon did is he found folks like this who, was, who were standing up and um, kneeling to drink and bringing the water to their face. He would keep them and retain them, and he would throw these people out. He didn't think he could win with these, uh, with these people because um, they weren't alert. If you notice the people here sitting up are alert. 
and maybe alert to danger and maybe good, um, I guess, soldiers to have in your army. So, okay, so the idea of separating, the idea of using some inference, because they're making inferences. I mean, these guys down here, they might be great soldiers. I mean, this, this one here seems to have a pretty intimidating looking spear, so they might be great soldiers, so they could be wrong. Well, it turns out that they went and they won the, you know, I guess they won the battle, so. Anyway, I, I don't want this to be just some general reference or a, um, me floating off too far afield. This is referenced really right up front in the uh, Braden reading. Okay, so the first, one of the first things Braden says is that intelligence tests, the primary use of tests was to allow institutions to select, reject, okay, just like Gideon did, he rejected some soldiers, or assign individuals to existing structures. Test results primarily allowed institutions to fit people into structures, okay, rather than to fit structures into to people's needs. This is such a hugely important statement, because when we talk about the harm of aptitude by treatment interaction thinking, right? We realize that it violates a number of different kinds of ethical principles. So the principles for professional ethics of the National Association of School Psychologists, which you as a professional in a pre-professional are learning to sort of uphold. Well, principle one, uh, section one, Part one says that children have the right to autonomy and self-determination. Okay, when we make inferences and reject students on the basis of intelligence aptitude test scores that we can't observe directly because they're smart or they're not smart because they've hit some cutoff score, well, that violates their autonomy. It violates their self-determination. They can't use those abilities to then turn around and improve something. Whereas if we identify some skill deficit, like words read correctly per minute, and analyze that well, identify, let's say, an acquisition deficit, we can help that student understand their, their acquisition deficit and help them chart and graph their way to more words read correctly per minute. It's just an example. All right, so... It also sort of violates the notion of institutions that are trying to fit people into structures, okay, violates not only standards of ethics, but the whole notion of ecological assessment that our entire department here at UMass Boston is based upon. The idea that what we need to do as treatment providers is help people learn about how the environment can bring about problems and to make some adaptations, not only in the way that we think about problems, some personal, intrapersonal adaptations, but also how we can go about changing the environment, helping teachers to develop new skills, helping schools to develop new programs, helping children to develop a new set of skills, um, all of those sorts of things that are malleable and changeable. The thing about fixed aptitudes, or the thing about aptitudes is, is that they're often seen as fixed and very, very challenging to change, if at all able to change. I'm trying to build up my intelligence by, intelligence by playing Scramble with Friends a lot. Right? All right, so what's the harm of aptitude by um, treatment interaction thinking? Uh, so I've already talked to you about the sort of the absurdity and, and the challenge of really trying to figure out learning styles and learning aptitudes and how many intelligences there are. Um, in Sattler's textbook, we start with Spearman's approach to intelligence. We realize that Spearman said that there's two types of intelligences. Thorndike, his multi-factor factor theory, said that there was three. Thurstone believed that there was eight, whereas Guilford's um, theory, his structure of intellect theory, built up 120 different kinds of factors. Vernon's hier hierarchical theory said there were six. 
Cotellan Horn says that there's nine broad areas like fluid ability, auditory processing, but 54 specific abilities. Okay, and that goes on and on and on. Sternberg's triarchic theory, Gardner's multiple intelligences theory. These are all different ways of talking about aptitudes. Okay, so one of the one of the harms there is it's it's just darn confusing. Okay. Um, saying that people have different so that's that's one. Um, but the notion of harm, it's really challenging to think about harm here because saying that people have different ways of learning is not obviously or overtly harmful. Instead, it's a kind of harm that's sort of like a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's a banal, boring kind of harm that nobody really notices at the individual level. We think people care about kids when they say that they have different learning styles. And it's not to say that they don't care about kids. It's, it's saying that the statement may be an indicator of misguidance or maybe an indicator that we're not adhering to... Um, we're not adhering to evidence-based practices. I want to be very, very careful and very clear to say that I'm not the language police, and you shouldn't be either. We shouldn't be looking at teachers and saying, wow, they just said that this kid has a learning style. Uh-oh. That means that they're bad or uninformed. Um, certainly, that's not what I'm saying. It should raise a flag. I don't know if that's a red flag. It should raise a flag. Not so much about that person, but about the extent to which evidence is being used in a situation where a student is struggling to learn. Okay, so um, teachers' epistemologies and beliefs have certainly been linked to uh, certainly been linked to. Um, student learning outcomes. Okay, that's actually something that I cover deeply in in um, psychology and SPY six twelve through the uh, the work of John Hattie and his meta analyses. Okay, so there is a very strong link between the beliefs that people have about learning and um, and outcomes. Carol Dweck W E D W E C K Dweck wrote a book about mindsets and, and what we say and how we think about how other people learn, especially children, can really affect how they go about their day, okay? So be careful there because it's a disguised sort of harm, okay? When we hear things like he just has a different way of learning or he's a visual learner, we don't really notice the harm. But the harm is when a professional educator, often licensed and required to act on the basis of evidence and for the benefit of the student, turns to an old folktale. That's the harm. And they go to an old folktale as their, as their philosophy. Okay. The harm is, is that WebMD... Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to make an analogy to um, something I found on WebMD. WebMD um, has a neat little article. indicates that just about 2 million people per year are placed in the hospital from things like ear candling, putting butter on burns, um, giving whiskey to a teething child, putting silver on fungal infection, infections, and then dealing with um, heavy metal poisoning, and then um, the act of colon cleansing. So these home remedies, yes, believe it or not, people are doing colon cleansing at home these days, so avoid that. So these home remedies that people swear by, I know people, um, uh, holistic, holistic, I don't know, what are they? What are they called? Holistic practitioners that swear by ear candling, um, but there's quite a bit of harm that could be done with that, right? So the analogy here is the indication or the belief that, or the belief in learning styles, could be an indicator that we're interested in folk tales rather than evidence. Okay, so one of the goals of this class, not this course, but this class, is to introduce you to some of those evidences, the braid, uh, some of those um, sources of evidence, the Braden paper being one of them, the Walcott paper actually being a better better source. Okay, um, Walcott and Phillips on page four start to build a case for, uh, let me turn you over to the Walcott uh, reading here, start to build a case for why 
aptitude by treatment interactions or IQ achievement discrepancies might be harmful. Uh, they talk about cognitive process training, okay, um, Walcott and Phillips, or um, as I know them, Christy and Miranda. Christy was my colleague at East Carolina, and Miranda was one of my uh, star students. And she wrote this really cool paper um, to the NASP communique. So what they're arguing for here is that cognitive process training is actually an outcome of an aptitude by treatment interaction. It's a pretty exciting outcome. So you'll see what they say here is that specific cognitive abilities have been found to be malleable. And in response to such exciting findings, it makes sense that researchers would explore opportunities to target specific kinds of aptitudes or brain systems with interventions. Okay? So they go on to say, let's see what's going on these days, and they summarize the evidence. And they said that several studies are showing that if we use aptitudes, then we can start to improve student abilities. But unfortunately, you don't see generalization. You see what what's called near transfer. That means that targeting aptitudes like visual processing, executive processes, um, symbolic classification, short-term memory, that sort of stuff, working on those things directly doesn't transfer over to academic tasks, which is the primary reason Reading, writing, and arithmetic, I guess we'll say, which is the primary reason why kids are in school. Okay, So they go on and they talk about the findings from a systematic meta-analysis, concluding that immediate training effects are evident. Okay, So if you use CogMed or Lumosity to build your memory skills, well, you're going to be great at memory tasks or tasks that involve memory or that specific kind of aptitude you're not going to be very good at generalizing that skill over, okay? And that's what this little area is about. And we said that no significant improvements on measures of verbal reasoning, word reading, or arithmetic were found. Thus, the evidence to date does not support the notion that working memory programs produce significant positive outcomes on other related tasks. Braden found that. Gresham and Carey found that as well. Okay, but Braden goes to say, Braden will come right out and say it, a number of times, I'm going to point it out in the uh, abstract right up here. Essentially, he says limitations to what can be known a failure to prove is not proof of failure um, should lead us to not give up. Right? We shouldn't give up searching for perhaps aptitude by treatment interactions, but right now we can't say that the evidence supports them. All right. So let's get back to what the harm is. Okay, Let's get over to the principles of professional ethics. Okay, so the NAS Principles of Professional Ethics, right there, 2010, we're going to look at the um, first principle, uh, and that first principle is autonomy and self-determination. I already talked about that. Okay, the idea that if we decide to act like magicians and say that things that we can't observe, these, these crystallized abilities, these short-term memories that students have, if we are to say, we are to infer that these things mean that a student should receive a certain kind of treatment, well, we have a great responsibility, and that responsibility is to ensure that that student can build a set of skills from, the, from our assessment. Okay? Well, because that assessment doesn't translate into intervention, we may be messing with a student's autonomy and ability to become independent learners in the curriculum. All right. Um, I also should pause for a moment and say that I find intelligence testing and intelligence, I, I guess you might say aptitude by treatment interaction research, to be fascinating and very, very interesting and exciting. But, like Dan Reshley and others, it lacks utility. It lacks usefulness. Sort of another way to say that would be to say, I find it interesting, but I find it very useless. I learned how to give tests just like you guys did, intelligence tests. I learned how to give uh, achievement tests just like you guys did. And what survived, that is, every time I did a uh, evaluation, wrote up an evaluation report, 
I found that I couldn't use the findings to write recommendations. And I think it's uh, Gresham that uh, comes right out and says, says that. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, right here. Okay, so we see, let me zoom in a little bit. School study teams, further, school study teams often ignore the results of intelligence testing in making classification and placement decisions. So when students need help for learning problems, the results of intelligence tests and the time, I mean, the time that school psychologists spend, we don't, we can't really do anything with that. Um, it's really hard to find uh, any kind of achievement test or evaluation report that can make that sort of direct linkage. Oops. Um, oh, there was the class schedule. All right, so let me go back to the principles of ethics and then kind of um, finish up. Let's get over to um, 2.3. Okay, let's take a look at uh, 2.3.2. .2. School psychologists use assessment techniques and practices that the profession considers to be responsible research-based practice. Well, intelligence tests are not considered to be research-based practices when it comes to being able to link um, assessment to intervention for students with learning problems, okay? It's a problem there. This, is, this makes it a problem in using intelligence tests, okay? We're asked to select assessment instruments and strategies that are reliable and valid for the purpose of the assessment. If a student is having a reading problem, there's no need for us to go through the process of giving uh, an intelligence test. And that's true even if the district's policy is or your boss is telling you to use an IQ achievement discrepancy, okay? You will not be only acting from what your boss tells you as a professional. Um, I apologize to those of you who already know this. <laughs> um, as change agents, we will be responsible to act according to our professional standards, as well as, to some extent, what your quote-unquote boss and supervisors require of you. So that presents a conundrum. And how our students are addressing that concern is, is when they're looking for their internship and they're looking for their sites, they're trying to assess whether or not those sites use um, outdated non-research-based practices. Okay. So there's a number of different types of harm that could come from uh, using intelligence tests. Okay, So when we talk about treatment validity, the title of Braden's paper, or the title of Gresham and Witt, we talk about the utility of intelligence tests for treatment planning. Braden calls that intervention validity. Okay, A number of other people, including Meal, Kronbach, um, Messick, some other folks that talk about validity, I want, want to talk to you about what validity really is, they say that there's a type of validity that we haven't paid attention to, and that's called consequential validity, treatment validity. That means what happens as a result of the assessment, so the treatment validity of assessment results. So what's an alternative to the aptitude by treatment interaction? I can sit here and criticize all day long, all of us can. Right, so what's the alternative? Well, I want to show you something by Matt Burns um, in 2011. This is a paper that he wrote in a series that I edited. Um, it's called Matching Interventions to Skill Deficits. Uh, the work that Matt did with Robin Cotting here at UMass Boston established a new way of going about treatment validity, a new way of going about it that is known as a skill by treatment interaction rather than an aptitude by treatment interaction. So what we have here is a really neat little study that Matt did. He found a kid named James, this isn't his real name, a student's real name, who had a deficit in procedural math. And what that means is they had a real hard time, made a lot of errors in doing math calculations. 32 times 27, that sort of stuff, okay? identified that that student had a procedural deficit. Found another student, Thomas, who had a conceptual deficit. Now Thomas could do his math procedures quickly, okay, 
He could do 327 times 43, really nice and nice and fast. But he couldn't explain to you why. Okay, so he had what's called a conceptual deficit. Now, out on the intervention market, there are conceptual interventions for students who have a problem thinking about math. And then there's math studies. There's studies that, I'm sorry, there's um, interventions that target fluency with doing math procedures or math calculations. Okay, So based on what we think we know, all kinds of different interventions could be given to kids like James and Thomas. Thomas, for example, could get a procedural type of intervention, if he do, even if he doesn't need it. Okay, so that was the case. That's what Matt wanted to test out in this study. So what he did was he looked at skills on kids that had conceptual deficits, like Thomas, gave them a procedural intervention that was contraindicated, that wasn't linked to the assessment, and found that there was really no growth. You'll see that week one all the way up to week eight, where the procedural intervention was given, no change from baseline to procedural intervention occurred. And that is evidence, to some extent, that's a little bit of evidence for this uh, contraindication effect, that Thomas didn't need a procedural intervention. Thomas needed a, probably needed a conceptual intervention. So when he got it during weeks 9, 10, 11, and 12, that's where you really saw the growth. Now, when you go up here to James, James really needed a procedural intervention because James wasn't good at doing math facts and math calculations. When he got a different kind of intervention during weeks, um, let's look at weeks four, five, and six, he didn't grow. Okay, that intervention was contraindicated. But when we linked the intervention, when we used a skill by treatment interaction, we took a look at his skill deficit found that it was procedural in nature, gave James, who had a procedural deficit, a procedural intervention, we started to see some growth from week 7 to 12. So a skill by treatment interaction is an alternative to a aptitude by treatment interaction. Okay, so the John Hosp reading that you did, the third reading, introduced you to some new terms. Okay, uh, let me put up a, a blank form so I can just write these terms down for you. Um, let's do this. Okay, so some of those new terms that HOSP uh, turned us on to were terms like testing. Okay, a test is simply a means of gathering information from students, from a student. It's a way of gathering information. Measurement. Measurement is assigning an attribute like reading fluency or reading ability to a number or assigning a number to an attribute. So saying that a student can read 67 words read correctly per minute. It's like height and weight. Okay, so measurement, testing, assessment is the overarching process of gathering information through tests and through measurements. So actually assessment should come first. Evaluation is about the same thing as decision making. So it's when you make a decision on the basis of your results. Okay, so HOSP is really helping us clarify where to go next. He also helps us understand evidence. And uh, when we looked at the handout on the site, the handout um, from my book, um, uh, my book draft, the table on evidence-based, we find that there's so many different confusing terms related to evidence and evidence-based. There's terms like empirically supported. There's terms like evidence-based intervention versus practices, and I could go on and on. Okay, so HOSP helps you differentiate a little bit there. Helps you understand it's all sort of part of the same pie, that what we're looking for is the results of an experiment, or more than one experiment, like Matt Burns' experiment, to tell us that a certain kind of approach works. So Matt's approach is a skill by treatment interaction. And you get this when assessment results indicate an intervention. When assessment results are just used generally, it could be what's called a contraindication. Okay, and that's 
these are medical terms, but we want to use these terms to indicate or to say that we know something about linking assessment to intervention. Okay, so I want to leave you with this notion of a skill by treatment interaction as an alternative to aptitude by treatment interactions. My goal today was to clarify what was meant by an aptitude by treatment interaction and to illustrate a skills by treatment interaction that occurs when assessment is linked directly to intervention. Okay, I wanted to separate myth from reality. I hope to have done that by going over the Braden and Gresham readings. Um, I went about tw <laughs> 20 minutes over my guess. I thought that this would be about 25 minutes, but um, I wanted to spend as much time as, it, as I needed to um, to elaborate on um, some of these points and some of these readings that can be pretty challenging to get through. So go back, make sure you read that, uh, make sure you take a look at the Willingham video. I think that's going to bring a lot of the difficult concepts to life. Hopefully some of the things that I talked about today did too. Um, at least one or two things I hope was helpful. Um, and uh, I thank you for your time and we'll see you soon.